Hello, I think we're live, although I cannot see us on YouTube, Tim. So, oh, there we go. I, I think it started. See. That's going to start. With, hello, everyone. Let hello, me start up properly. World. Hello, hello. Welcome to our live cast today. Thanks for joining us if you're live. And thanks for uh, joining us if you're watching later on. It's me, Rick, and it's that guy, Tim. You appear to be Tim Russwick, whereas I am just Tim. Sorry, God, I can't even. <laughs> you're not again. Tim. <laughs> I'm just Rick. There's too I many asked, Tims in the universe right now. There is, there is. I was asking Tim what he thinks about my background. He's like, well, it suits your personality, Rick. I'm like, <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> Although I was the one who put the background there, so I should take full responsibility for how it looks. So At some uh, point, you did look at it and be like, you know what? I like that one. You know what? That one will do because I'm in a rush <laughs> and we've had so many technology issues with our live cast. But uh, one thing, so today we're talking about productivity and how to get better at stuff, how to be good at stuff, all that kind of good jazz. And one thing that I wanted to really emphasize, the fact that Tim and I have been working on our live cast and transitioning from audio, which we'd finally figured out after quite a few attempts, into video. And if anyone has been watching us the last, I don't know, what is it, three or four weeks we've been doing video, it's always a bit of a gong show. There's always nonsense that's going on. Technology's not working, like lip sync not working, just stuff not working. And the lesson here, the, the moral of the story, the thing we want to highlight is that this is the case with anything you do when you start it off. There's going to be bits that don't work, that's broken, that you don't know what you're doing. You look a bit of a fool, et cetera. And so Tim and I have deliberately been trying to look a little bit of the fool to show everyone out there that that's just the way of the world. When you're a beginner, things aren't going to work right. And the only way to get good at something is to be bad at something. The, the only way to get there. You can't start off being an Olympic gymnast the first time you walk into a gymnastics yeah. arena. You have to tumble and fall over and not land the flip and not know what you're doing and do a little cartwheel and all that kind of stuff. So there we that's go. the thing. That's a lot of people stuff. stop. They, they stop doing that stuff. They stop... Um, achieving, they stop even trying sometimes because they don't want to look stupid or they don't want to fall on their face. And uh, you'll never get there if you don't fall on your face once it, or twice. It's everything. And, you know, most of what we talk about is game development within that context. But I think this relates to everything that you do. And it could be if we narrow it down a little bit, you might say, I want to get better at 3D art and put some assets into my game. First time you do that, they're going to look dumb. You know, they, yeah. they, sorry, let me let me use better words in this because that's a little <laughs> bit of a flippant way of doing it. I, I'm, I'm looking at myself and what I would think about it. They're going to look not to the quality that you know you could get to. And if we make fun of ourselves, like, oh, it's going to be dumb and it's a bit silly and, ah, oh, you know, I know it's not good enough yet, and just make light of the situation, I think that helps. If we get too serious about it, too kind of like, oh, my goodness, what are people are going to think about me? I'm not going to be able to walk around in public because everyone's going to know there's Rick, the guy that had a character that's arm um, clipped through its other arm and didn't have collision set up properly. Uh, people are fine with that. People don't mind. Yeah. Uh, and one of the absolute best ways, I'm going to transition into this, Tim. You might not be ready for it. Uh, one of the absolute best ways to go from being a little bit scared to do a thing to doing it and maybe not having it so good to getting a bit better at it and getting a bit better in the land of game development. Tim is. Oh, it's me. You're, yeah. you're leading me up to that. I was leading up to that. Uh, one of the things you better say the same thing that I was thinking far, far. Look really foolish. You know what? We're used to that by now. We're away. Um, yeah, I think, I think continuing with something and doing it, uh, for an extended period of time, whether or not you're good at it, I think is important and sticking through uh, the the negative stuff. You weren't um, listening. You weren't paying attention, were you? That All that lead up, you're like... I got distracted. I'm not going to lie. I got distracted. <laughs> <laughs> this is the problem when we do video. There's so many things to be taken care of. But anyway, okay. Yes. So <laughs> let, let me try that one more time. So in terms of game development, if you want to go from being not so good at something and get that transition, maybe you're not ready to release your first game yet, the perfect kind of event for you to do out there is... Oh. Well, the you perfect still don't know, kind do of you? event... I, I, I get it. Let me share my screen real quick. 100 points for um, anyone in chat who knows what the heck I'm talking be, about. It might be a... A game jam. There we go. Look at that. You, we are. Look how aligned we are. We should jam. be a married couple. We're so I, did I get it? Same. Did I? I no, just no, no. I read your mind. It worked. Um, 
I think game jams are super important because they teach you a lot of skills uh, that you otherwise wouldn't learn. So when you're learning game development, you've got to learn technical skills. You've got to learn um, production skills. You got to learn soft skills if you're working with a team. You got to learn a bunch of stuff. Uh, and then there are so many different points along the way that uh, you have to completely just learn new things. Like when you start a game, you have to learn how to use the engine. When you're building a game, you have to learn how to uh, maybe refactor code or like make code work together, make code more modular, right? Um, when you're publishing a game, you have to learn how to like make stuff look pretty and make people interested in it and describe it in a way that seems fun and all that stuff. Uh, and then when you're publishing a game, you know, uh, and actually launching it commercially, uh, you have to learn how to sell it and make people buy it. So uh, I think going through that whole process um, is interesting. And Game Jam is kind of that whole thing, minus the selling part, um, slammed into a few days. And I think it can help you uh, accelerate that learning curve. That makes and sense. And we have announced in a couple of spots the date for the annual Game Dev TV Game Jam. Yes, Tim? Do we are we ready to yes. lock it in here with our I think we can show I shared my screen. I think you have to approve it. I'll do I'm um, sorry. Well, maybe maybe Tim. I don't know. I don't know if we're ready for that. I don't, okay, I, fine. Do you think they should here we go? The game jam, the 2022 game jam for game dev TV. We'll pop this in the uh chat so everybody can sign up if they want to. But it officially is starting May 20th through May 30th. It is a week long with two weekends on either end. Uh, so it's 10 days total. Uh, and we've got something super awesome to announce. So everybody that submits a game, every single person that submits a game in the Game Jam, they're going to get a free course of their choice. Every single one. Any course they want, they get a code that they'll be able to redeem it. We'll get the details worked out. We're not really sure how we're going to do all that yet. <laughs> it's, one of, it's a good idea. How are you going to do it? Up, 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 up. We'll figure it we'll out. We'll figure that out. It'll be fine. So the game jam starts in a month and seven days. I just linked it in chat. Uh, it, if you want to just go on itch and search for the game dev TV jam 2022, you'll find it, but you can go ahead and click this little join jam button. That'll get you registered. And then it starts on May 20th. Uh, we are going to have a ton of stuff this time around. We're going to be uh, streaming some stuff. We're going to be playing some games that are getting submitted. We're going to be uh, hanging out with the community the whole time. It's going to be a lot of fun. This is going to be a lot different than the, the previous jams, the previous years. So, I'm really, really excited about this. Keep an eye on this page. This page is going to update. We're going to have a lot of cool stuff coming over the next five weeks. <clears throat> and uh, I'm excited to to do it. Honestly, then, I'm going to do it. I'm going to join this jam this time too. And me, I'm really, really excited. Me too. I think we're all going to give it a go. And you know what, Tim? We, You and I were talking about this yesterday. We were saying the whole point of the game jam is to get people to participate and actually submit their game, even if it's just a little... Right cube running around that bumps into another cube and then you know it says game over whatever it is it doesn't have to be polished it doesn't have to be amazing it doesn't have to right. be the greatest experience you have to submit it you have to get there and say i i did a thing and i finished it go through the whole process so we just wanted to give you a little bit of a well done a pat on the back a thank you and that was the idea of saying what can we do that would be interesting to some people in our community and we'll say okay any of any of our courses you get to choose one of them for free if you submit as a reward for submitting, because we really, yeah. really want you to submit. That's the whole, that's what we're up to here at Game Dev TV. We want you to get better at making games. And the best way to get better at making games is to actually make games and to submit them into yeah. a game jam. And so that's the whole point. And I see a couple of people saying like they're they're noobs and they're, they're, they're concerned about joining. Like this jam, everything about this jam is designed for you. Uh, we don't have our starter kit live yet, but we're going to actually have a starter kit that's going to give you some code and some assets and stuff to, to work with if you've never joined a jam before. Uh, our, it's 10 days long, so even if you have a full-time job or you're going to have some time where you got to do stuff, you're going to have plenty of time to actually build a game. And we are going to be holding your hand the whole way through this. So even if you're brand new and you've never done a game jam before, I promise you this is the jam to join because there's going to be no judgment. We're going we're gonna to be super happy with everybody that uh, joins and wants to partake, partake of this with us and kind of uh, have fun. It's all about having fun. It's all about making games. And you don't have to have a crazy groundbreaking game, uh, even if you want to get your free course, right? You could just submit what you have or whatever you ended up with. A lot of times, if it's your first game jam, 
let's be real. The game that you make isn't going to be groundbreaking. It's not going to be Halo. It's not going to be, you know, some of the crazy epic games that you play. It's going to be a game that you're capable of making. And that's okay because that's the first step to making a better game that you're capable of making. Right. Yep. And, and we're just excited for all this stuff. Exactly. And the whole point is if you're going through one of our courses, then choose one of the sections. Say, for example, you're going through the, the Unity 2D course and you're up to the point where you're doing the snowboarder section. Um, and that's using all of the sprite shape stuff, looking at that and saying, well, okay, instead of it being snowboarding, I'm going to make it grass boarding or I'm going to make it um, skating. Or I'm going to put the character on a bike. I'm just going to draw a little bike in something. Right. And then there we go. And then instead of the things going like that and doing a jump, I'm going to have them go like that and do a jump. There you go. There you've made a game. And then if you're looking at it and you're saying, well, that's just sort of doing the same as the course. What's the, what of that is, is me in it? Well, then just tweak some of the features, uh, tune it a little bit, change it a little bit. You don't have to do something. You don't have to come up with a new idea. That's the whole point that when you're on your first one, just do anything and copy what other people have done, copy something from one of the yeah. courses, but change it a little bit uh, so that it, it represents you. And I'd say the way to make something that you can say to people, hey, this is there's some challenge in this game. Just put a timer in it and play it a couple of times yourself and make the timer so it's pretty difficult to, to win the game. That's all you need to do. It's like, hey, see if you can beat this before 50 seconds. And then people are like, okay, I know what I'm doing. Oh, 52, I nearly made it. That's the way to make it a, a game where you've got a challenge and people can succeed or fail. Just put a timer in there. Yeah. And you've got a month to figure out how to do a timer if you don't know how to do a timer <laughs> yet. And on top of that, like I said, the community is going to be doing this together. All of us are going to be doing this together. We're going to have live streams and all that stuff around it. So it's going to be super fun because not only are you going to be able to build a thing that you just kind of thought of, uh, but you're also going to be able to do it with a bunch of people and we're all going to work towards an end together and it's going to be fun. And at the end, we all get to play each other's games and share feedback and stuff like that too. Yep. Um, and we made very clear too, we want to incentivize the submission, submitting a game, not winning the game jam of any sort, right? There's no first prize. So it doesn't matter about making stuff uh, amazing or making the next Halo or whatever. It's, it's more about finishing your first game. That's a huge, huge milestone. And we want to make sure that as many people do that as possible. Absolutely. Yep. There's a question. Uh, I think it was for the game jam. Do you pay to join? No, you don't. It's completely no, free. free. No money, no transactions. No, you don't have to do any of that kind of stuff. It'll be hosted on itch. So itch.io. Uh, Tim, question on that. Is LinkedIn. hosting your game on itch the only way to submit or can you host it on say sharemygame.com, which is the game dev TV spot? Or could it be a web-based game that maybe is hosted natively? Or does it have to be, you have to make a thing that can end up on itch? And and can you can you host a web-based game on itch? Or does it have to be an executable? So uh, all games have to be on itch, but itch is super versatile. It allows you to link to other websites for your game. It allows you to upload uh, downloadable executables, and it allows you to embed uh, HTML uh, or web games directly into the pages. So um, nice. you'll want to do that, and I'll have I'll have a bunch of resources and stuff how to do that because that's another thing is uh, when a lot of people get to the end of the game jam, they're like, how do I submit? And then it takes them a few minutes to make the the page, and then they miss the yep. submission because they forgot about that part. So awesome. I'll have a bunch of details and information on how to do that and how to actually submit the, before we go live. Okay, that's really cool. And because uh, and question from uh, Tumo, g'day Tumo, good to see you on here. Are TAs allowed to participate? Absolutely, of course, yeah, 100%. We Everybody. expect you to. We expect you to do something cool. Um, and I am I was talking with my daughter last night, and I've been teaching her Scratch. If you guys don't know about Scratch, it's a, it's it's basically the entry point into learning game development. It's a, a completely online web-based thing, and it's drag and drop with the little boxes that snap together for the coding. Um, and I'm in the process of working on a Scratch course. So if you've got any kids or absolute, absolute newbies who are, uh, a bit scared of programming and want to do something really, really simple, then Scratch is a great, great way to start. And I think with her, Tim, I might work with her and make a little game in Scratch and then we'll submit that into the awesome. into the game jam. And the, like, seriously, if you're sitting there saying, I'm not ready, I'm too much of a beginner, I don't know what to do, you can make a game in Scratch in an hour. 
Uh, like you really can. And it can be a game where it's like, oh, this is kind of cool. I have to, oh, I nearly got it. Oh, watch out. I've got to dodge the thing. And you can do that by following a tutorial and then changing it a little bit. You can add your own flavor to it. So there's, you should never be sitting in a, in a spot where you say, I just don't have enough skill yet. Or I just don't, don't have any yeah. ideas yet. If you've got zero ideas, hang out in the community and ask. If you don't have the skill, then use a simpler um, program or just follow a tutorial and tweak it. So this is the one. If you've been waiting, and when we did our a, a poll the other day, how many people or how many game jams have you participated in, I think about 75% of people said none. They haven't participated in any game jams. So this is the one. This is your first one. It's coming up end of May. Uh, so it'd be a great time and we're not trying to sell you anything here. We're pushing on it hard, come and participate, but yeah, there's, there's no sell it's going free. on here. It's just purely, we know it'll be good for you. So please give it a shot. Yeah. Uh, there, there are a few rules and stuff that we'll go over, um, a little bit later, but nothing to worry about. This jam is going to be super fun. And I promise you, if you haven't done a jam before, this is going to be so rewarding to hit that publish button and have other people play your thing for the first time. It's a fantastic yeah. experience. Question from Dave. Is it possible to work in a group for this jam? Yep, absolutely. Teams are allowed. Teams are allowed. Teams are allowed. Any um, any engine you want to use is allowed. We will announce the theme later on. If we announce it now, then people are like, oh, I'm just going to do a little bit of sneaky stuff on that now. Yeah. But the point is you don't start until the game jam starts. Uh, and then, yeah. Tim, why why 10 days covering two weekends? Some game jams are just over one weekend. And yeah. in the past, we've had our game jams go for ages, like a month or something. So yeah. what was the logic in the amount of time that you've chosen? Good question. So I'm actually a fan of shorter jams because I feel like, especially with beginners, the, the more time you have, the more you can overcomplicate things and make things like crazy, way too large. Uh, and then you end up not finishing because you're just you're trying to design World of Warcraft. Uh, but the thinking behind this is that a lot of people are beginners, so they're going to need a little bit of extra time to think through their design and, and plan stuff out and learn stuff. I think a lot of people are going to be taking our courses as they're doing a game jam, uh, which I fully expect. But the idea is that I wanted you to have at least a week, but then a lot of people only kind of have time off on the weekend. So we wanted uh, uh, two weekends in there in case you only do have time off on the weekends or in case you're, you know, you're working a lot you need to you can only work on it after work that kind of thing we want it to be accessible for people that anything from college students where you got all your free time to like you know you only have an hour or two a day we wanted to make sure that everybody could kind of fit in and make something of some scope don't college students have to like do school work and go to class and stuff that's overrated they just <laughs> no i love it who does college that students with all their free time <laughs> <laughs> it is true. That's true. I remember being in that boat. Um, oh, yeah, cool. That, I'm super pumped about it. And, you know, we're announcing it now. You've got a month to to free a little bit of time up. Uh, yeah. And, yep. and we'll talk about it a bunch more between now and yeah. then, of course, and, and give you lots of tips and tricks. But it's a good one. Good one to have your first shot at. Yeah, How old exciting. do I need to be to participate? I don't think there would be a minimum age. Would you have to be no. a certain age to submit? There's no, like... 18 plus you can be I, we're not we're not checking i mean it's not like you yeah we won't we're not, not like you're trying to buy please. drugs or something although i think there's <laughs> probably not an age for that is there <laughs> bad example <laughs> alcohol uh so uh, yeah i mean you can five years old you can submit if you're five or three it doesn't i mean i was saying before my daughter is 10 so we're going to work on something together and submit it i think it'll be fun that's awesome that's really um, cool yeah I think as well, Tim, I, I know there's some rules in terms of you need to create everything yourself. Um, is there a way for us, if someone says, well, I want to use some asset pack assets, is what what are the rules around that? I, I know in the past it's been, you can use them so long as they're freely available to everyone. For yeah. example, Kenny assets, but you can't go and spend $50 and then have your game look, you know, super spectacular because, you know, everyone else doesn't have access to that. Right. So that that's the primary rule there is you can use free assets on the internet. They just have to be freely available to everyone. So uh, one of the ways that people have kind of, if you're an artist, for example, and you really want to use your own um, assets, that's totally fine. You can make your stuff. But if it's already pre-made, uh, if you can release it online for free for everyone to download, and then you can also use it in the game. But similarly, any Kenny assets, anything on open game art that's under the CCO license, 
opengameart.org. They have a bunch of free assets. And you know what as um, well? We might be able to provide some assets as well. I think we have some stuff coming that they yeah. can uh, they can look forward to. We're going to have a lot of announcements over the next five weeks leading up to the game jam. So, Oh, uh, mega scans, yeah. If, if you're using Unreal, then you've already got a million assets you can use. So, yeah, mega scans, yes, you can use that. I think legally, legally, you're only supposed to use mega scans assets in Unreal projects. But I think if it's a non-commercial project, don't quote me on this and don't tell Unreal I, I Epic I mentioned this, but you could probably use some Megascan assets in a yeah. Unity project for a game jam and that's okay. Yeah, and the, the main thing we have to worry about too, so part of this is a learning experience, right? And so everybody that submits a game jam is also gonna upload their source files to, um, to itch so that other people can learn. Right, so if like some, if you see a really cool game that you're like, oh, I wonder how they do that, you can actually just download the source files and look, and see how they did that. Um, and that's a that's a really big part of the jam. So um, if you have paid assets, for example, you'd have to redistribute those, and that's against the license. You're not allowed to do that legally. Mm -hmm. So free CCO stuff uh, that's freely available online is distributable like that. So yeah. I think easy. I think Mixamo animations is okay for that stuff. I think because they're they're free and I think you can probably You're, just and it's an iteration. You're binding it to a model as well. Yeah. So it's like a if you change stuff, that's totally cool, right? Like you can yeah. modify stuff uh, to where it's no longer its own thing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I'm at some point, Tim's going to put out, hey, vote on what you think the topic should be. Or maybe, maybe then people will get a heads maybe. up on what it's going to be. Maybe. Um, but I think it should be something with some sort of animal reference in there. It doesn't have to be a specific animal <clears throat> dog. It can be any sort of, I think maybe, I think the thing should be something like, you're an animal. What do you think? And then anyone like who... Cat. Anyone who wants to, yeah, to do Jumpy Cat can do Jumpy Cat. Or a similarly named, wittily named game can do that. I think they can do whatever they want, but I think we should leave it up to them and not influence them with their You their, know what? Uh, I don't care Jedi what the theme powers. is. The theme, the theme might be like um, Royal Majesty Shoot Fest as the theme, and there's going to be a draggy dog running around Hopefully in my the game. Hopefully the theme so. is not that. <laughs> <laughs> Royal Majesty Shoot Fest. What it's like you, you can't really get Draggy Dog out of that. <laughs> anyway. So when people are looking at it saying, oh, I don't know if I've got time to do a game jam. Sounds like a lot of work. Uh, I've got lots of things to get through. Uh, let's talk a little bit about productivity, Tim, and how to manage your time, how to get more efficient, how to get more effective. One thing I want to kick us off with, I've just finished reading a book called Atomic Habits. I'm going to put it in the chat here, the name of it, okay. Atomic Habits. Really good book. And there's a lot of these books out there that are like, you know, help you get better at stuff. The reason I like this is it's so tangible and, and real and practical from the point of view of saying, okay, uh, good habits you want to make as easy as possible to do as rewarding as possible as clear as possible bad habits you want to hide the things that trigger you to do them and you want to make it unrewarding and unfulfilling etc it's like okay well that all makes sense the model itself makes sense but just something as simple as saying well if it's a habit you want to do more of then put the reminders right in your face so for me i, I don't stretch enough i need to stretch more i'm an old man and i'm a little bit you know tight in the legs and stuff i go running and everything's just like tight so for me, um, to have a yoga mat sitting on the ground, uh, normally I have it rolled away and put in the corner. I'm like, oh, I couldn't be bothered, you know, stretching. It's a big, big hassle, waste of time. Well, not waste of time. It's probably pretty good for me. But it's a hassle. I just don't remember. I don't want to do it. But if I get a yoga mat and put it right next to where I walk every single day, if I put it right next to my desk just here, then I walk past it. I'm like, okay, I may as well just do a couple of stretches and then keep walking. It's right there. It's a reminder. It's so right. easy to do. And so the flip of that is if there's any bad habits, for example, watching YouTube, jumping onto Netflix, playing a game, etc., remove out of your visual line of sight all the things that trigger you to do that. So if you've got a game controller, which I do here, thankfully it doesn't trigger me to want to play games. I'm beyond that stage from a game playing point of view. But if you've got a controller laying around and you're trying to do your work, work on making your game, 
and you see the controller and then part of you starts to sweat and you're kind of like, oh yeah, maybe I could take a little bit of a break and play a little bit of Call of Duty for the next five hours. Then put the controller somewhere else. Go to the extent where when you finish playing the game, take out the batteries and put it in a different drawer. So you've got that little bit of a barrier to go from, I'm just sitting here doing my work to playing my game. You actually have to get up, walk to the drawer, put it, the batteries in a drawer that's in another room, put the controller in a different room, put the controller in your washing machine, you know, make sure you don't forget that it's in there, of course, but you wanna make it difficult, not impossible. It's the same with the TV remote. When you finish watching TV, take the batteries out, put the remote somewhere else, put it um, you know, way down the other end of the house. So just, make it difficult to do the things that you know are bad habits that take you away from your goal and make it really really easy to do the things that are good habits that take you towards your goal that's just one example check out I, I really like it as a book i got a lot out of it so making it easy to do the things you want to do and hard to do the things you don't want to do is super great the other part of uh what i found for me for especially for like habit forming and stuff like that mm -hmm. is piggybacking so like it's really yeah. hard to form a new habit by itself but you already have a bunch of habits, right? So if you can just piggyback off of your current habit with something else, um, like I brush my teeth every night, right? That is just the thing I do. And if I wanted to do something else every night, if I did it at the same time, uh, not while I'm brushing my teeth, that would get complicated, but you know, right after, right before, you can kind of like, uh, if you, you can attach it to that other habit and then slowly, 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 you end up with two habits on top of each other, which is really cool. Um, and there's a lot of uses for that. Um, there's a lot of, uh, what was the book? Um, Hooked by Nur Eyal. Have you ever read that? I, oh, I don't think so. Although interesting, so of, you, have you read Atomic Habits? Because the, uh, the piggybacking maybe. idea is in that book as well. If you're uh, already maybe. in the habit. I've of, read a lot of habit books. I don't yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, me too. Maybe. It becomes yeah. a blur as well. Like if you've read 50 of these books and it's like, yeah, have you I read one of what you just where. I Maybe I've read yeah. that one. The yeah. reason I remember Hooked though, because Hooked is more for product creators about how to make um, hooky products. And some of it is a little like past what I think it goes into the addiction territory and that stuff, which is, you know, eh. But one of the things that I did like about that book was the idea of like triggers and that everybody has some sort of trigger. So if you look at like actually a lot of the North American pop songs, um, like you guys remember the song Friday, the crazy like it's Friday, Friday, Friday. Friday. Gotta, Gotta get, get down, down on Friday. Zoom You're in for the. Wait, wait, wait. Here we go. Here we go. Well, no, that's me. How do I get no, you? No, you could do it. No, I want to get you. I'm done. I'm done singing. But you remember that oh. song? So one of the reasons that that song got so popular was because there was a trigger built into it, and that everybody says the words it's friday that happens yeah, yeah. constantly and so that triggers a part of your brain that actually makes the song like stick and like trigger right and if you look at like taylor swift or britney spears or a lot of these people they actually include phrases and stuff in their songs that are common yeah. because they're they kind of they trigger you into remembering the song um and Th those are super important for any kind of like habits and productivity and stuff like that too, because the same thing happens when you sit down at your desk, right? For example, if you have a desk where you only do work, when mm. you sit down, your body kind of goes into that state of like, let's get to work, right? Like I remember um, for a while I had, my office was practically a Panera Bread, which is like a little cafe here in the United States. And um, it's, it, they have like you order up front and then like they have just a bunch of seating and Wi-Fi and stuff. So I would go there because I didn't really have anywhere else to work. So I'd work from a laptop. And um, I remember that like no matter how I felt, even if I felt like garbage, even if I did not want to get anything done, even if I was just totally done for the day, I would walk in there and my body would like whoop, go into work mode. <laughs> It just like it knew this was the spot where you get the work done so much so that I had to stop like eating there because I can't just eat there anywhere. <laughs> so I would go there and try and get a sandwich. I'd just be like, no, you're in work mode now. And it was weird. Um, but using that kind of stuff to your advantage, I think, is uh, part of getting more done. It's not so much about plant doing this crazy science of planning stuff. It's more about kind of hacking your psychology, I yeah. think, to get stuff done.
side question what do you what do you viewers uh live viewers prefer the not so close to us or the right up in our face one so let us know it's close or far <laughs> yeah yeah i don't know um, it maximizes the screen it's a little bit it's a lot of us though might be too much but we'll let we'll let the 30 second delay of people letting us know just close or far um and yeah so in terms of of productivity as well i think you've got to really 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 care about something people talk about what's your why i think that's yeah. okay but you, you need to care about it and you need to i think find a system find a mechanism that works for you so i like in you know obviously to play games as a as video games play games but i like to play games in life and i've got two kids one of my two daughters one of my daughters is very logical um analytical like my wife we got one of each one like my wife one like me so one's very analytical and and whatever and the other one just like me likes to play games so if any parents out there uh any parents out there are um you know can relate to this when you're getting your kids to eat dinner they eat the good stuff and then they get to the stuff the vegetables they don't want to eat it and they're like dragging on taking forever all that kind of stuff so one of my daughters if we get there and just say can you please eat all your food She's like, oh, okay, fine, and grumbles, but does it. The other one, can you please eat your food? She's like, bip, 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 whatever, I don't care. But if I get there and say, okay, I bet you can't eat your food within four minutes, you're like, okay, blah, 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 goes for it. Because it suddenly became a game, it's fun, it's interesting. And I think often when we read books, it's coming from the point of view, or, or talk to people or listen to people, it's from the point of view of this is what works for me, therefore it should work for you. And that's not necessarily the case. If I get there and say, okay, I need to do four things today and I'll see if I can get through them yeah. in two hours because yesterday it took me two and a half hours. That's fun. I enjoy that. There's a purpose to it. There's a meaning to it because I've made this little artificial game. Other people might look at that and say, don't care. Who am I competing? This is, doesn't make sense. I don't, I don't want to do that. So you need to find a system that works for you and, um, and, and not try to shove an incorrect system into your psychology. Yeah, you know, the other part of that, too, is I found that the system that works on you can change over time. Um, and that's a little confusing sometimes, too, because sometimes at different phases of your life, that whole, you know, do one thing every day kind of thing really, really works. That consistency works. And then sometimes you realize, like, hey, you're burnt out. You actually need time away from it. So that whole uh, do one thing every day philosophy maybe doesn't work so much as it did, whereas, like, now you you might need sprints, right, of, like, I'm going to work really hard for two weeks. And then take two weeks off of my project um and and trying a bunch of stuff i think is important because um you got to figure out what works there's something that'll work for you in your your kind of ecosystem in your kind of timeline and so many times people are like oh my god i tried this thing that this book said or this youtuber said and uh it didn't work at all and you know then they blame them or they blame whatever but sometimes stuff just doesn't work in your your area and you got to figure out and, and not only that but sometimes you got to make your own thing right like i'm going to take this i'm going to take that and i'm going to combine these two things together um yeah. i really like pomodoros and i really like sprints personally the consistency stuff worked for me for a long time uh but now I'm more in like, I want to do a bunch of work for a small period of time. And then I want to take a break and I want to chill out. Um, so stuff evolves over time too. You know, it works for me and doesn't work for me. So here's my, my book that's got my stuff to do in it. It's loosely following the bullet journal approach. So if you haven't seen the bullet journal, it's something interesting to look at. Um, I, when, whenever I do digital to-do lists, I don't feel a relationship to it. It, it feels like um it, it doesn't have the same meaning but when i've written it down with my hand with a pen and then i put a tick in the box when it's done i connect with that a lot more and as i'm going throughout my day there it is right there i don't need to go and open an app i don't need to have it sitting on my on my second monitor or whatever the book is right there and when i start my week i'll grab my book and i'll write out on this side of the page i'm writing out Here's all the stuff that I've got to do at the moment, and I put them into my categories, so um, so I know you know they're grouped. And then over this side of the page, I've got the five days, the five work days of the week. I try to only work well. I 
work on the other days, but I try to only have my his stuff I've got to get through on the weekdays, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and I, I put it down as I go. And so each morning I'll get there and say, what am I doing today? What are the three most important things to do? And I'll look at my, my backlog over here, and then I'll write it down. So that works really well for me. It's always there. It's tangible. It has a, a substance to it, and it works a lot better for me than digital. But other people... They'll walk around with their phone, with their list. They'll have it on their computer. It's all synced together nicely, and, and it works that way. So once again, it's one of those do what works for you, but just wanted to share with you my approach. It, it has to be a notebook. Uh, and then if you want to take that the next step further with bullet journal type stuff, I, I did start this bullet journal wise where there's a journaling aspect to it. So each day you write down, you know, what are you, what are you grateful for? What are you worried about? What's important to you, et cetera. So you get an opportunity to, um, to give voice to that, to work through some of the things that might be clouding you. Often, if you just sit there and write for 10 minutes about here's what's important to me, here's what I'm thankful for, you can switch your mind from I'm not in work mode to I am in work mode. Sometimes when you just sit down at your computer and say, right, what am I going to do? The first thing that yells at you is going to be some sort of distraction or some sort of leisure or some sort of you know social media. Uh, but if you're writing things down in terms of what's meaningful to you, then you can you can trigger your brain to start down the correct path, you know, correct path yeah. for the day. Yeah, I've I've definitely that that whole three things that are what are the three most important things to get done today. I think that has dramatically helped me quite a bit with uh, getting stuff done because there's so many things, especially in game development, but in life too, I think there are things that you start down that path for where you're like, okay, I want to get these 10 things done today. And I can totally do this because they'll each take 10 minutes each and it'll be fine and everything's great. But then for whatever reason, that one thing just takes six hours or whatever. Um, and it's, it can take a lot longer than you thought it would. It could take a lot more mental energy than you thought it would. Um, sometimes for whatever reason, it's not completable today because you need input from other people or something, um, or things change or the rules change or, you know, whatever. Uh, but if you can get, if you can kind of focus on that and not even always get them complete, right? Like sometimes I get pushed to the next day or whatever. Um, but if you can focus on kind of that and like, what are the most important, three most important things that I can do today? I think you, it's not just about getting more done, but it's about getting the right things done. Yeah. Right. Because a lot of times there's so many things on your to-do list that just aren't important. Like my game launched with like a thousand things in the Trello board, right? Like, mm. and I was hundred percent sure those were super important, and I could not launch the game without those. But two years later, nobody noticed, and it's fine. So yeah. there's a lot of things like that where if you're constantly asking yourself what's the most important thing, you are kind of cutting, uh, trimming the fat a little bit, and and cutting straight to the point. Oh, you cut out for a second there. Or maybe I cut out. You're back now, though. Hello. Welcome back. Hello. Yeah. Um, there's, there's, something, there's something very important to be said for looking at your system and seeing if your system is broken or not. Nearly always, if you're procrastinating or not being effective, <clears throat> pardon me, it's because your system is broken. And I think one of the, the best things you can do if you're – stuck or procrastinating or not getting your work done is is just stop and take however long it needs to take whether it's an hour or a day or a week stop and fix your system and don't do any work just fix your system the best thing to do first is clean your desk clean your work area get it tidy get your cables tidied up my cables are a mess at the moment because i've there's a hundred of them i don't know they breed i come in i'm like oh the mummy and daddy cable there's now another seven cables i don't get it but so many cables everywhere and and it creates a little sense of clutter in my mind which is not a yeah. good thing so i need to get there and organize them and tidy them up so i'm like okay that clutter is gone there's things on my desk that shouldn't be here move that clutter there's some dust do some dusting so you get to the point you're like okay there's nothing in this immediate space now over there against the wall or over there that's going to remind me to do something else that's going to trigger me to head in a different direction. So that's why cleaning your room, cleaning your desk, I think is if you're not being productive and your environment is messy, you've got a really easy win straight away, which is to clean it up, to put things in a place, to put them in a spot. If you're sitting there and you're like, ah, I, for a while my mouse wasn't working. 
the what was it the scrolly wheel wasn't working and it was like i had to scroll it 17 times just to move one thing and i persisted with it because i'm i was gonna say i'm cheap maybe i'm frugal you know <laughs> I, I only get a new thing when the old thing really really doesn't work i don't like going and spending money I, the mouse mostly it's 90 percent good and i like this mouse but it was so frustrating every time I did anything and it snapped me out of my good flow. Working away, working away, this is great, doing some good stuff, scroll, scroll, ah, God damn it! I hate this mouse. So it took me out of the flow. So there's things like that you need to address. You need to go and fix the mouse, replace the keyboard, upgrade the RAM. Some of these things cost money. So you might be sitting there saying, well, I don't have the money. But then there's a question, what are you doing? Like, what's your goal in all of this? Are you being a professional? Or are you being just someone who pokes around a little bit at what you're doing? And if your computer isn't good enough, and that's the reason you can't work on your game, and that's the reason you're scared to enter the game jam, and that's the reason that you haven't gone and applied for the job, and that's the reason you haven't got, gotten better at 3D art, then change your focus in life to getting a new computer. And I, I really like the philosophy of Gary Vaynerchuk. If you watch his stuff, he talks about, if you're in the US, this I think is very relevant, it's the whole weekend arbitrage um, flipping stuff approach. Go around to, to people doing yard sales, buy, you know, have your phone looking on eBay. Here's some toys that someone's selling for two bucks. I can sell each of these for $20 each. I can make some money. So he's talking about that philosophy of there's money to be made everywhere. You just need to go and put some effort in to do it. Uh, he also talks about look around your house and see what you can sell. Okay, do you need that thing that you haven't used for three months? Do you need the, um, you know, the skateboard that you don't ride anymore? Find the things around your house and sell it. Get the new computer that's holding you back. Get the whatever. Get the laptop that allows you to go work out at what was it? Panera, Panera Breads. Panera, Panera, yeah. Panera. We don't know that. P A N E R A. Panera. Panama, Panama hat, working over at Panama hats. So yeah. if you need a laptop because your home environment is just not conducive to doing good work, then save up, sell things, do work, get that laptop, you know, take your savings and, and go and make that happen. So there's so much that we put off because it's not quite convenient. Make yeah. it convenient and make it the priority. Yeah, a philosophy I've kind of lived by, because I'm kind of frugal too. I don't spend a lot of money. I don't buy a lot of stuff. But mm -hmm. I've really adopted the philosophy of, of spend my money where I spend my time kind of deal. Mm -hmm. Of like the computer specifically, I don't put a budget on. Like the computer, the desk, the chair, the camera, the mic, the, the equipment that I use every day to do the things that I do, um, I'm not cheap with. Like I, I can spend money there and I cannot feel guilty. I used to for a long time to like, ah, I really don't, you know, I don't really need that. But wherever I spend a large amount of time, I can invest a large percentage of my income into because those are the things that are actually not only are they generating the money in my case, but they're also, you know, uh, like, dude, the a chair. I spent so long trying to find like the right chair and I didn't want to spend a lot of money, but I'm like, I sit in it for like, six hours a day like i need i need I, sometimes it's six. double that <laughs> only six and i thought really i try not to about <laughs> i try not to sit very long because i yeah i fucked up my back and my posture no i hear you man it's not like, good and you know yeah. that's a thing as well get a standing desk or a, sorry get a yeah. get a desk that can go up and down so you don't have to sit all day long you can also stand from time to time yeah yeah. But investing in stuff like that where um, you spend a lot of time, I think, is is a is a really good way to kind of figure out whether you're on track with kind of your budgeting and stuff like that, too. Because a lot of people spend money on crazy stuff. And you you can. You could do whatever you want with your money. But if it's crazy stuff that, like, you're going to use once or, like, you know, if you, if you use that iPod, iPad, you know, once a month, while you're watching TV, do you really need the latest iPad? Like, is that really a thing? You're not spending yeah. a lot of time on it, right? But phones, for example, you might use all the time when you're in line, when you're out, when you're everywhere. That makes sense to invest more in a phone than a tablet, uh, at least in my case anyway. It's really, phones is an interesting conversation as well. I'm I'm running a, you have a look at it. Oh, that's an alarm telling me to go speak with Tim. So it's all, it's busted at the top. I think most people run around with busted phones. It's a Galaxy uh sorry, Samsung Galaxy S7. These things, uh, whatever, five years old now, six, seven years, they're pretty old. I had one of these and then it broke. So I went and bought a new one of these 
second hand <laughs> old one of these the same model i'm like i don't need to upgrade because this one i can do the stuff i need to do and if i go and use a new one and be like oh so much better i can never go back but i don't need to go forward just yet but i can buy yeah. a phone in you know in us dollar terms for maybe a hundred dollars this one breaks hundred dollars breaks hundred dollars you don't need to go and buy the seven hundred eight hundred thousand dollar phone you, you can get by with a, a cheaper phone because they're, they're still good. I mean, and we were super happy to use them five years ago. We weren't getting there and saying, oh my goodness, this one doesn't have edge. I can't do whatever the edgy controls are. Um, and camera, well, I don't know. I'm not a professional photographer. I don't need to have a 700 megapixel, um, you know, the, the most amazing camera in the world. I just need a camera that can take some happy snaps, so. You know what I will say on that, Rick? Like, so I do, I actually respond to a lot of like messages and stuff on the fly. Like the most of like my responding to emails and discord and all that stuff uh, is, is on the phone. And I've noticed that for me, that super snappiness is actually really important on the phone. Like it's super mm -hmm. important to me. So I, I don't upgrade uh, like every year, every two years or whatever. I upgrade when there's like a reason to. And the last reason for me was the 120 Hertz display. Uh, and then a larger like eight gigs of RAM. So for a phone, soup. Yeah, <laughs> it's so I will say it's it's being super snappy. All the apps open super quick, and then the screen is 120 hertz display. This is a OnePlus 8T. It's still an affordable phone. I think it's like a six hundred dollar phone. Like it's not like a twelve hundred, fifteen hundred dollar phone. Yep. But um, having that experience super quick and snappy so i'm not sitting around waiting for stuff to load or or anything yep. like that um i think is important because again those are things you do constantly so being interrupted from that flow i think is mm. um and you know and that's a that's a really good point because i was talking before about if you're being held back by your computer then do everything you can to to save up to get that right. computer and for you if well that for me is my phone um then that's cool phones what's important to you and i think different people have different money as well if you're living at home with your parents and your parents are loaded they're like you need need a new phone there you go are you having trouble yeah. with blender not working properly let's buy you a new computer it's like fantastic you're in a situation where you can you've had a number of the barriers removed to doing what you need to do cool that's good i think it's it's easier to be motivated in life when you have to buy the computer yourself and then you're like i spent so much money on this damn computer i'm going to use it i'm going to get value right. out of it i think it's in a way and again i'm talking to the parents out there it's really difficult when you buy your kids stuff does your kid appreciate it as much are they going to use it are they going to understand the value of hard work and having to sell their skateboard to buy a computer so you know there's a real there's a real balance to have there but um you know if if you've got money you know your computer's fine and you can buy a phone then of, of course go do that I, i'm i'm assuming there's some folks out there who are price sensitive if you're not just go buy all the gear you need and just get on with it <laughs> make your games like for me tim i was telling you this the other do you know how long i've gone without a teleprompter just a goddamn <laughs> like 150 dollar teleprompter anytime i've been doing my videos that have required me to say something correctly i've been trying to memorize it hey welcome to this thing it's really important whatever and about a hundred takes later i get the right thing and i finally like you know from my tight purse strings of i don't want to spend any money finally went and got a teleprompter which is basically just a mirror that you put a you know a phone or a laptop in front of that works hooks into your camera uh now i can just read it and just get it done more quickly so i've saved future time i should have done this a long time ago but yeah. uh, sometimes you don't prioritize these things well, you know, and along that line too of like you you spent money where you spend your time and you spent money where it's important to you, right? And, yeah. and make better at those things. And I think that's super important. Like I think a lot of times people only look at the price of something and they say, oh, I can't afford that. But like if it is something that is super important to you that you're going to use more often, I think it's important. Um, I So for a long time I used Inkscape on – and I still use it as a, like a primary like uh, all of my art goes in Inkscape. Um, but I had a lot of trouble with like the mouse, um, and it's, I use, I do vector art. So like I have to manipulate these vertices and like change stuff around and like, it, it's very precision work uh, with a mouse. So like, it just gets complicated. So I started seeing like Apple pencil and iPad and stuff like that. And I was like, you know, I really think that I would use that. I tried a tablet. I tried some cheaper alternatives, like an actual tablet 
uh, not with the screen, but like the ones that you plug in USB yep. and you can draw on. That just didn't work for me. Uh, but I actually picked up an iPad on eBay, which was like secondhand, and an Apple Pencil, and same deal. And it radically changed the way that I did vector art from then on. Because like mm. I can take that iPad anywhere and I can like draw stuff. And there's an awesome program called Vectornator Pro, uh, which is which has literally transformed my art. It's it's made me ten times better um, because I can draw directly on the screen. And and the program is just it's it's made for touchscreen devices, so it's not like that's the thing about Inkscape is it's open source and it's great, but because of that, it's kind of archaic in a way. And there's a lot of features that people yeah. think it needs <laughs> that it doesn't really need. Um, but yeah, so like it's while you could, you could look at that and say, okay, you know, you could have made a bunch of vector art on the computer. Why did you spend money on an iPad? Well, it's cause it, the value I got out of that, especially secondhand, any kind of technology, if you order a generation or two behind, you're going to get a crazy good deal for what it is oh, yeah. compared to, you know, what it is and phones same deal like you order a generation or two behind you can get 80 percent discount on the the retail cost of the phone so there's definitely uh yeah just, just reiterating what we said it's like spend your money where you spend your time but also there are ways to to get stuff for cheaper and um technology yeah. is something that i think a lot of us we need to do especially to make games right like we need this stuff so they're tools it's just like a hammer and a drill and all the other uh, tools used for woodworking. Abs absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you guys have any questions, Tim and I can answer questions or any stories you'd like to share about your own productivity tips, then uh, dive into them. Tim and I will continue to pick out the things that we find super useful and important. The One of the other things that we do on our team, and, and this is more of a team conversation, but we have uh, we have we use Slack for our communication. And it's just work communication, what well, just the, the team communication. And then we have Discord, which is to communicate with, uh, you know, you guys out there in the community. We don't try to use Discord for our work communication because that way we can have a separation. You know, I, I usually don't have Discord open during the day because there's a lot of things that will sidetrack me and take me off course, like very, very easily. Uh, but I have Slack sitting there all day long on a monitor because if someone has something they need to talk about, it's, you know, we need to talk about it right now. Uh, so there's things like that that you can make a distinction. One of the things I, I talk about in our Finish It course, which is a course all to do with productivity and finishing your project and getting it done. So the Finish It course is to, um, to separate your work browser with your not work browser. And so for me, I have two profiles. And it's really easy now with Chrome. You can you can do it super easily. But I have on my what's the thing down the bottom where all your your taskbar? No, no, in Windows, the taskbar I think it is down the bottom. There's one browser which is personal, one browser which is work. The personal stuff, I'm like, yeah, I'll watch some YouTube and I'll you know whatever, book the airline, do the things that are just for me. And then the other one is work stuff. And so when I go into, sometimes I accidentally go into the wrong YouTube thing. I'm like. In the work one, why is YouTube recommending all this nonsense that I'm not interested in? Ah, it's because I don't watch videos on YouTube um, on in, in, in the work browser. So keep that separation. That's one yeah. thing you can do. Just little things. Make it one step more difficult to have distractions pop up in your life. I picked up that tip from you, Rick, and I've been doing that ever since. Um, uh, you can actually do it with a Chrome profile. Hmm. Um, or you could do it with separate browsers like Firefox versus Chrome, or you can actually do it in Chrome profiles. I think you, you showed me that. So yeah, yeah, I couldn't go back to that. I love that. Cause then I can keep all the tabs open for work stuff. And I can keep all the private tabs open for private stuff. Yeah. And even um, I see the recommendation in here using tab groups. I, I think tab groups are great. That'll help just tidy things up, but I still, if it's in my personal browser, even if it's hidden, I know it's there. I'm like, unhide it and, and go, oh, I'm going to go check out the things I shouldn't be checking out. Um, Contegra's Game says, tip, do the worst thing on your list first. Eat the frog. I agree with that. That's yeah. It's one of those things that you have to try for yourself and see if it works. But generally, getting the thing that you're afraid of or you're dreading out of the way can be super, super motivating. Um, it's It's different than, you know, there's a different philosophy of like, starting with the most exciting thing to get you in the door, uh, depending on what, what you're having problems with. Um, but getting the worst thing over with for the day is also definitely a good strategy. Yeah. I think there's a question in there. Um, I'm just searching for this, Tim, so maybe you can 
Oh, you know what? I can just show it. If I've got the skills, I might just be able to show it. So the finish it course, I think there was a question in there. Do we have a course for managing, managing all this stuff, managing ourselves? Um, so that would be the finish it course. Uh, I don't think I can actually look at it properly because I'm uh, not set up to do that very well. But uh, do, 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 share my screen, share screen. Seamless, this whole conversation. So make sure I share the actual correct cool. screen. So this is the uh, finish it course, and it's just all about motivation and processes for game developers. For game developers, course. Uh, so th this is it's all about just getting stuff done, working through the process, having a good structure to it, tips and tricks. So that's a good one if you're looking for any of that kind of, but how do I do it type stuff. Back into this one. Mr. Vastian asks, uh, have you already suggested breaking things down into more manageable tasks? Um, I think that's a good point too. So a, a lot of people, they're not productive because the things they write down as to-do lists are way too large, right? So like um, we see this a lot, like I have a mastermind group that I'm a part of and like we always set goals for the next two weeks and stuff like that. And one of the things that comes up is people will say things like, I wanna finish the demo. And it's like, okay, what does that mean? There are a thousand mm. things in there. So finish, like, how do you, there's no success metrics for that, right? Like of finishing the demo. Like how, if you give me the demo at the end of two weeks, how do I know whether it's finished or whether it's not finished, right? So things like fully implement the uh, spawn system, right? Or make, have the ability to spawn an enemy. Then there you go. That's quantifiable. I can say, yes, you did it or no, you didn't. Um, it's also a part of that bigger whole. So breaking it down into specific, there's a whole smart thing, specific, measurable, whatever the thing is, something timely. Uh, Actionable. Yeah. Yeah. Rick based. Um, look up smart goals. Tim based. The the A the R and the team smart. <laughs> Rick and Tim. I'm pretty sure that's the that's the that's it. That's it. But um as long as they're specific and they have um you know, uh, timelines, I think they, they work pretty well. Uh, so you could just have st, st goals. St. Yeah. Smart is probably, that's a better acronym. Than, than Spe I think specific it. is, uh, it's all about being specific. Like what, yeah. what is it actually going to be? The, the art or that mart is I think <laughs> less important. It's just being specific. Um, yeah. but you know what, Tim, I, there's some interesting research that I think I I've been trying to test out in my own life. So we've been taught smart goals, you know, specific, measurable, I'm going to do seven of these, and I'm going to get it done by this particular date. I think that's a that's a good way to roll. And for some people that works very well, or for some tasks that works well. For other things, there's a philosophy of not being specific, but having a goal, which is I will do the most I can or the best I can. And, and I think that often works because you, um, you know, say you're going for a run, He's like, I'm going to do this run in 30 minutes. Well, I, I don't really know how, what pace right. to set. Like I'm not skilled enough to know here's the exact speed that I need to be running now to do 30 minutes. But if I set the target of I'm going to run as fast as I can, then you can run and, and there's a very good chance you'll be under 30 minutes. Or I'm going to get as many bugs finished or, or fixed today as possible, just as many as possible. And then you, you work on it. And it could be that you get 23 bugs done. Whereas if you'd got there and said, I'm going to get 10 bugs, you know, removed from my game, maybe that's valid. Maybe it's not. Maybe you can get more than 10. Maybe you can't get 10. So I think there's also a real philosophy of saying, I, I'm going to yeah. work as I'm going to be super focused for four hours. And that's still specific. The four hours is specific. But rather than saying, I'm going to get 18 items done in four hours, you just say, I'm going to be focused and work hard for four hours. Yeah. That's a good way to do it as well. There's a technique called the Pomodoro technique, named after <laughs> the guy that invented it, uh, which is basically what you're suggesting. So it's like Elvis the Pomodoro, idea is you, right? Yeah, Who invented you it? get a you get a timer, you set it for like an hour, and then you just put it in front of you and say, "I'm going to work as hard as fast as I can for an hour." And then at the end of the hour, you take a five minute break, and you might do, you know, a couple more of those in a day. And I find personally that if I do four of those in a day, I usually get more done than a 16 hour day. 
right? Like if I do like four hour focused work sessions, especially if there's like breaks in between where I just go do whatever, you know, sometimes I watch a YouTube video, sometimes I get something to eat um, and then sit back down and do another hour focused of like, I want to get all this stuff done. Um, it seems to work really, really well. Uh, and then too, by the nature of game development too, there's so many things, there's so many rabbit holes that you can end up in, right? So you need, you need a more flexible system sometimes um, because fixing that bug may include refactoring code you wrote from three weeks ago, which includes writing new code for an old system. You know what I mean? Like there's just, mm. you can go rabbit hole very quickly. Um, and I don't think you can reasonably say fix 10 bugs in an hour because like, you know, fixing one bug might be a semicolon, fixing two bugs might be <laughs> refactoring half your code. Um, mm. so yeah, it's, you need a flexible system like that. Yeah. Yeah. And there's plenty of other things. I mean, it, I kind of, I'm tempted to go through all the things that are popping into my head that we teach in the finish it course, um, accountability buddies. Uh, Lottie was raising that. I think accountability buddies are great. The important thing is that if you make a promise to yourself, if you're not yet at the point where you have a, an ironclad, um, you know, if you give your word to yourself, you absolutely do it. You'll get to that point if, you can, if you're consistent and you keep building that direction. But before you get to that point, often giving your promise to someone else is more impactful. You're like, well, I I'd said I I said I'd yeah. work on my game, but I'm sort of tired. Is really, you know, I I said to myself I'd work on. I'm tired. That's different to saying, I told Tim I'd get this thing done, and if I don't get this thing right. done, I'm going to come and clean his toilet with a toothbrush. So you know, there's a if you get the accountability buddy with some fun, charming, quirky punishments, you know, or rewards, then that can often keep you motivated. I think. Um, and you know, there's, there's the whole, we've talked about loneliness a lot. It can be lonely being a solo indie yeah. game developer working at home. Maybe your family doesn't understand what it is that you're doing. You just need to have someone to talk to about it. Oh, Hey, I, you know, I've got three bugs fixed. Like my movement was, you know, this, this announced that, that, and someone else to be like, Oh, that's really good. Well done. You're like someone else in the universe cares. <laughs> I think that that alone can help keep you moving forward. To have yeah, someone it, say, yeah, you are working on the right stuff. It's like, oh, thank goodness. Yeah, yeah I'm doing the right it, it really depends on you, right? Because some people really need external validation. Some people really need, you know, guilt motivates them for whatever reason. Some people are kind of run, their internal systems are run by these different things. So figuring out what you need uh, is important. Like one of the things that works for, it, announcing stuff used to work for me. But then I built the whole community. I had a stream and you know i did all that and it just it stopped working over time just because i just like thousands of people are expecting me to launch this game it just doesn't do what it used to do for me right like in the beginning that was crazy now it's just like whatever um but one of the things that does work is immovable hard deadlines and the problem with any deadline that i set is usually movable and soft so like stuff like the next fest which is coming up in june for steam right uh that's something i set for myself because I haven't made much progress in my game in the last six months. Uh, and by signing up for the Steam Next Fest and joining and, and picking a stream date where I actually have to stream my demo and I have to have my demo live in the Steam back end uh, has given me kind of uh, a hard deadline that I can't move to get some stuff finished. So if I miss that, like I miss it. I miss a huge marketing opportunity. I miss the ability to stream. I miss all the people yeah. playing my game. And so that's immovable. So it allows me to kind of work towards that, knowing that like, you know, I've got to get something out versus nothing. Good question here from uh, Angelica. Um, I recently feel that some courses in university get in the way of my progress in game design career instead of pushing me forward as it is supposed to, how to deal with this frustration. So I've got a really, um, I, I have a strong feeling about university. So for context, I've been through, uh, what is it? Eight years of, of tertiary education. I have four different degrees or diplomas. So I understand the world of universities reasonably well. I've taught at universities, I've taught at schools and I teach online as well. So I, I really get it. And here's the problem I see with, um, with that formal university structure is that you, you sign up to a course or a degree or a diploma and here are the couple of things you're really interested in. And then what you're required to do is all these other things 
just in case, just in case you want to be, you know, more diverse. So you want to do game design, but let's teach you some graphic design. Let's teach you some database management. Let's teach you something else for, for a couple of reasons. One is they want that degree or diploma to be more full and rounded. And two, they're a business and they want you to be there and you might only want to be there for four courses, but they want to sell you 20 courses so that you pay more money. There's a few things wrapped up in all of that. You know, it's not it's not evil. It just is what it is. So our universities have always always done these Much things. Much more elegant than I would say, but yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so if you're there doing something that you don't feel is meaningful, don't do a very good job at it. Just just let it slide. Personally, I mean, you, it, your parents might watch me saying this and be like, "Oh my goodness, you have to get straight A's in everything." But if you're in a class and you just don't care and it's not relevant to you and it's not something that you want to pursue after that, then turn up to class. And while you're in class, think about and work on your other stuff, you know, start doing some game design ideas in your head, do the minimum minimum to get by on the things that you don't believe are necessary for you, or important to you, and do the maximum maximum on the things that are important and necessary to you. So that's, that's to work within the system if you're already in there. If you, if you have the option, drop the classes that you don't care about, that are not interesting to you. Like, don't, don't take this as, as gospel. So, you know, don't, um, make sure you do your own research. This is just one person's opinion. I don't want anyone suing me for like, you told my kid to drop out of school. How dare you? I'm coming for you. Like, you know, do what you think is going to get you to where you want to get to, but that's just it. Do what you think is going to get you to where you want to get to. If you want to be an indie game developer, then don't do the stuff that's all about making banking app, you know, software uh, that, you know, things that are related to that, if that's not what you want to do. So just do the stuff that's going to push you in the right direction. If you can drop classes, drop them. If you can change them, change them. If you can, you know, go to your school and say, hey, I want to do double of this. So give me double the assignments in that. And I don't want to do any of that. Give me half. Most schools will be like, no, that doesn't compute. But do what's going to get you to where you want to get to and do it with pride and with gusto, I think. I'm a little biased, but if I was in the United States and I was going through college, I would drop out and join a game dev TV course. But that's just and me. Then, I think this is, this is the thing as well. So what <laughs> universities and schools, game schools, and you know, I went to a game school and I've taught at a game school, what they do is they give you structure and they give you deadlines. You have to get this assignment done by yeah. next Wednesday or else you fail. You're like, oh, better get my thing done. That's really good. So if you're the sort of person who doesn't need that, because you're like, well, if I choose to do a thing by next Wednesday, it'll get done. Then one of the main reasons you're at school has just gone away. The other main reason is knowledge. And the internet now is so powerful that, like Tim's saying, for a small amount of money, you can get a lot of knowledge from a course and you can go through that course and get really good at a thing. And then... It's all about practice. And how do you practice? You participate in game jams. You make your own small games. You talk to people. You you download other projects and look at how they did their code. You, you listen to podcasts. You have conversations with other developers. You find someone who's done a thing that's maybe one step in front of you. So, you know, you're working on your first game and they're working on their third game. You have a conversation yeah. with that person like, hey, can we chat and can you give me some pointers? So you really immerse yourself in that landscape and you get very proactive in terms of making and doing and then a lot of why you were going to school is not as needed you know you you don't need that structure you don't need that um you know that social connectivity because you're getting it on your own so don't drop out of yeah. school based on this conversation keep doing what you're doing but prioritize and focus on the things that matter yeah i and i really believe that taking a course online you'd like game dev TV's course or, and, or doing a game jam, I think is going to teach you a lot more about game development than most two year or four year courses will at a typical university in the United States, just because they're not, they're not set up for practical skills. Most of the time they're set up for general stuff. Like you have to go through two years for your AA just to like learn math and science and, and English and all this stuff. Right. Like, so uh, if you want to learn, how to do something. There are usually more tactical, practical ways to, to learn how to do it uh, versus these systems. But those other systems do have their advantages too, um, especially meeting in a group full of people that are interested in the same subject is can almost be priceless sometimes, right? So, yeah. And, and yeah. you know, I think 
I think we should recognize a couple of points in here. It is very country specific. So, you know, I've my experience is Australia, Canada, US, UK, in terms of my frame of reference for these things. Other places, they might be like, no university degree, you don't even get a look in if you want to go out and get a job. If we're talking about indie game development, it doesn't matter whether you have qualifications or not, no one cares. They'll look at your game and say, is this cool? Do I like this game? Is it fun? Is it interesting? It's all about what your capabilities yeah. are, what your aptitude is. Um, but other, if, if you're looking to get a job, there's still a lot of places that say, you know, university degree is going to give you a big advantage. But the world's changing. I mean, quite some time ago, the Googles of the world no longer make it a requirement that you need to have a degree in order to get a job. I was talking to my brother-in-law, who's the CEO of a tech company. He was saying there's still an expectation that CEOs of tech companies will have an MBA despite the fact that MBAs are kind of a little bit useless unless you do an MBA in exactly the thing that your business is related to. So there's there's some old ideas about what's useful that's that's changing. In 10 or 15 years time, it's going to be really different. Degrees, they, they won't work the same way yeah. as they do now. Anyway, we're getting off the topic of, I'm going into one of my other rants, which was education. Maybe we need a whole uh, live cast dedicated to ranting about education but for now we're talking about productivity i don't know maybe we should uh be involved in a company that is changing the way education for game development works trying to trying to yeah um and it's interesting as well i mean our yeah maybe we will talk about education for a moment <laughs> if you look at if you look at the game dev tv business model we are a business and it's good for us to talk about you know what we do you guys can can learn from how we roll is that we've said we're in the affordable education uh, model. And affordable education, you know, $10, $20, $50 to get a course that's going to take you a few months to get through and we'll give not you forty k, Not, not 40000 So yeah. if you compare it, there's, there's this hierarchy at one end of the extreme. It's come to the flashy university and pay $40,000 a year, you know, and, and you get a lot of value from that. But do you get $40,000 worth of value? Well, it's up to you if you work really hard then maybe you do. And often it's about the the connections and you meet a person while you're there who can get you a job. So cool. <clears throat> and then there's, you know, all the way down the, the extreme, there's free on YouTube. And then there's the $20, $30, $50 courses. And then there's also folks out there with the $1,000 courses. And I think along with the $1,000 courses, you also get um, access to their weekly groups and, and some support, et cetera. Um, and I think there's some value in those, but once again, it's often the value is I paid a thousand dollars, therefore I better make the most of this. It's often a motivation value that the learning is not necessarily greater than the place we're playing in, which is the you know twenty, thirty, fifty dollar courses. So there's a whole bunch of of uh, it's a continuum, and I think if you go free it's going to be less time efficient. If you pay a lot of money, then you need to make sure that whoever you're paying the lot of money to gives you the outcomes that they're promising. Yes. 100% agree. Hey, you uh, you just posted and it posted as Game Dev TV. How did you do that? It's magical. I did this thing called uh, sign into the Game Dev TV account. So there's wow. a sign in button. Yeah, it's crazy. I got to teach you how to do this. Signing oh, in the council is, is, is that great. on YouTube? Is it? Yeah. Oh, I thought it was in the. I thought it was in our software that we're using. Because if I type, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, on okay. YouTube. Oh my god! Yeah. Don't learn from this guy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah, um, I for I. You know why? Because I have my work browser open, and my work browser stays logged into the Game Dev TV YouTube channel. Whereas my personal browser stays in the Tim Ruswick YouTube channel. Yep. So yep. another productivity tip from Rick. Oh, that came from me. Nice. I'll take yeah. credit for that. Um, any other questions that we haven't got to just yet? Um, I think we were, we've deviated a little bit from our conversation here. Um, yeah. And, I mean, the, just to finish that, that education conversation, Having a degree is better than not having a degree, just straight up. Well, like, how could it hurt? It, it, there's no way it can harm you having a degree. But if it costs an epic ton of money, it can. That's that's States. just it. That's just it. Yeah. It's a it's a time and money conversation. Right. Um, and you don't have to have a degree 
You don't have to go to school to succeed in today's day and age. There's so many, so many game developers and so many entrepreneurs and so many everyone's out there who they don't have any formal qualifications. They just went and did the thing. So just go do the thing and there's a very good chance you'll get there. That's how you get better at stuff. Just go and do it. It, it sucks because people come to chats like this or they read books about productivity and all that stuff and they want like the, the quick hack, the one simple trick that you can do to 10x your productivity while sleeping, right? But in reality, like most of it comes down to do the thing over and over again, like fail a bunch at first, like all the same stuff that you hear over and over and over. But you have to actually apply some of that stuff to get any results. So uh, a question from Mr. Vastayan. Uh, I have to come up with a new victory sound for Rocket Mania by Friday, Rick. Hmm, sounds like an assignment. Can I just use yours? Sure. I don't know what using mine is, but you can. Or if Make you want to snip this little bit, I'll give you some audio. So it's Rocket Mania, is it? Okay, here we go. Ready? I'll do some voice recording for you. So uh, you win Rocket Mania. Well done. Pew, pew. Buy some Game Dev TV courses. Yeah, Tim Rosswick. Rocket Mania. There we go. Use okay. that. You know what I love? I love at the end of uh, Honest Trailers, uh, how the Honest Trailer guy, Honest Trailers? Yeah, Honest Trailer guy with the epic voice does his, you know, you can request some things to be said. I don't think you and I quite have the same pool as epic voice guy, but uh, yeah, maybe that could be a feature of our live casts. We say some things that you can then put into your game if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I, something about me, something about this tells me this is an initiative that's not going to take off. This is, <laughs> is going to get us in trouble in a lot of ways. I hang out at the Game Dev TV live, live, what is it? Live cast, live cast, just to hear them say the dumb things at the end of it. <laughs> well, I kind of say dumb things the whole way throughout, but anywho. Yeah. Um, like any other questions? On video. There was a question about, uh, sorry, I forget who this is from. I've read it a couple of times. Uh, the Denner Wolves ask a question about pirated courses on other YouTube channels. If you see anything that uh, is our stuff on YouTube or anywhere else that you know is pirated, then uh, please contact Lucy at gamedev.tv or I think you can report it within the YouTube mechanism, but um, Lucy will pass it on. I think Mark also looks at this stuff. Mark at gamedev.tv. Um, just do everything Mark at gamedev.tv. I don't think he's listening at the moment. But uh, that's an even better reason to send it Mark's way. So thanks, yeah, if you find any stuff. Um, or ask them really difficult questions, and then um, if they're good answers, we'll, we'll pirate their answers. <laughs> I don't think you're going to get good answers, though. Yeah. Oh, the levels were a bit hot on those sound effects. Need to do it again. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah, my microphone probably was... I okay, one last it. time. Da, 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 da. You won the race. Yay. How's that? Yay. Yay. Oh, I've got a joke for you. Can I tell you a joke? Go for it. I've told this joke to my family and they think it's stupid and they hate it. So therefore, this is the Already. audience for this joke. This is a joke from Billy Brownless, who's a football player. So anyway, um, just to give proper credit where credit's due. Uh, so this guy, we'll call him Tim, walks into a library uh, and walks up to the librarian and says, uh, I'd like a cheeseburger with fries, thanks. And the librarian looks at him and says, uh, this is a library? And he says, oh, sorry, I'd like a cheeseburger and fries, thanks. Because it's a library and you have to talk quietly in libraries. It's it's actually funny when you explain it. I know, sense. I know. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's so great. One of my daughters is like, because you have to speak quietly in libraries. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, put that That's in the right. end of your game, huh? When you, you've crossed the, <laughs> crossed the finishing line because <laughs> it's a library. Um, NXRNT, I have no idea how to say that name. It says, as for tips for learning on your own if you struggle with focus and lose progress easier, um, following one of your courses, but just move on quickly. Um, I think there's a lot of little things. Like I said, you've got to try a bunch of stuff to figure out what works for you, but, uh, having deadlines, uh, to get stuff done, uh, that are external. So like, you know, if accountability buddies, that kind of stuff works, I think, uh, doing it with other people 
can help uh, motivate. Some people are really motivated by external, you know, kind of forces and people and, and all that stuff. And like, I know for me, like when I create something, I really like showing people for the first time. So like I lead up to that moment of like, I'm not going to show anybody the thing I'm working on until that moment when I could be like, look at the thing I made. And it's really exciting for me. So it's, it's very motivating work-wise to kind of work um, in private to kind of do stuff. So if there's something like that that works for you. You got to find it and uh, and and make that happen. Um, I also think figuring out why you're doing the things that you're doing, right? Like if you're losing motivation, maybe you're just not that interested in the in the in the content, right? Like if there's other things that could get you more interested, or there are external things that you could hook to it um, to make it more exciting. You know, you can try that stuff. I think one of the best things to to decide whether it's the right thing for you is just ask ask yourself the question should i just not do this anymore and if things are tough in life to be motivated for then maybe you shouldn't be doing it like if it's really difficult for you to sit down and learn programming then clearly you're not a programmer don't do it just quit let go and if if that whole conversation of you know maybe she just quit you're like oh no way how dare you suggest that then yeah you probably do have the motivation to do it I think if the option to not do it anymore, if you're if you jump on that quickly, then it's probably not the right thing. If the option to jump on it, you resist quitting, then yeah, maybe it's the right thing. But there's too many people out there doing something they think they should do. And they don't love it. Yeah, maybe should is a bad word. It. Yeah, should is terrible. Should is terrible. Um, but you know, often often courses can take a. It, it can be. It's work getting through a course it's learning it can be difficult and yeah. sometimes he, okay here's a tip then if if you're finding it difficult and you're getting stuck on courses and you're losing motivation maybe you should go and do the easy stuff again and not necessarily the same course so this is why we've got a couple of courses unity is a good example the unity 2d course and the unity 3d course the complete unity game developer 2d and 3d they're pretty similar in terms of the fundamental learning journey and the programming you're learning and and the the concepts uh but one's 2d and one's 3d and different projects throughout if you get to the point where you're stuck and it's not clicking and it's difficult maybe you haven't got enough of that that flow yet of feeling good about oh i know how to do this so you know get to section three in one of it and then if it's starting to get tough go do the other one and get to section three in that one by the time you get there things might be flowing you're like oh, i just i know how to do this a lot more easily now um but sometimes if, if things are a bit tough and not sticking, then it might mean that you're not quite ready for that part of it. And you just need to, you need to practice, um, you know, practice the easy stuff a bit more. Alternatively, like learning styles are a little bit different too. So like when I, I actually went through the Unity 2D and that's how I primarily learned a little bit about Unity. And I started to realize by like section two or three, I kind of, I knew enough about the engine to kind of get my hands dirty but I felt it was it was harder for me to just kind of watch stuff. So what actually helped me right after that was our skill builder kind of course. It's not really a course, it's like an anti-course. But basically a traditional course says, go here, do this, click this, write this piece of code. But skill builder says, here's a half working project, you gotta fix it, right? So um, transitioning to that at the kind of halfway point for me was super, super helpful because now I'm like, okay, so now I have stuff that's kind of working and I just got to figure out how to do it and I got to read the docs and I got to figure out which uh, word I use for the code here and like why this code isn't working. And that really stimulated my brain in a different way. Um, solving a problem for some reason was just way more attractive than like uh, taking the course, if that made sense. Because like I was just like, okay, this thing's already here. I just, I just have to fix it. And it really, really, really made me want to uh, kind of go through um, similarly too, the way that I've learned most engines at this point, I've, I've learned pretty much everything except Unreal, which I'm going to dive into someday when I have some time, um, is I, I have an idea. I have an idea that I want to make and it pushes me through to kind of learn the stuff. And, um, sometimes I've used Game Dev TV courses as reference too. So like one of the cool things about most of our courses is that they're kind of broken down in these little lectures that are very well named. So it says like how to use this system or how to use this system or whatever. And so it's really easy like, oh, I really need physics. And then I could go to the course part that says, oh, 2D physics. Boom, okay, perfect. I can watch that part and learn kind of um, on demand basically uh, has helped me. So 
you know, different people learn in different ways and different people have different needs. So that's important to kind of keep note too. If you, if a course is hard for you, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, it's bad or you're bad. It just means that, you know, it might not be the right thing at the right time or, you know, you may need to learn a different way. Yep. All good stuff. Too many um, Unity courses and not enough Unreal. We, we are rectifying that. Um, we've got the... <coughs> pardon me <coughs> the unreal c++ course is getting a remaster uh we've got our unreal first person shooter blueprint course which is out there now currently working on a small quick um unreal environment course which is showing you how to use quixel um quixel bridge and the mega scan assets just to make a, a level and to make it look good um uh, we're talking with another gentleman about maybe making a um uh, I don't want to promise that one just yet, but yeah, we are, we're trying to bolster the amount of stuff we're doing, uh, with unreal. And we've talked a number of times about an RPG and unreal RPG. So that's a, that's a maybe it, there. Are, it's a big beast, but we would love to get into that and do it. It's a maybe coming down the pipe in the future. Yeah. Unreal five is, is brand new. It just came out. Um, and it's super exciting, super exciting territory for us. Um, yep. You are getting shiny new courses right now because UE5 dropped down. Well, yep. UE5 is fun and exciting. Everybody likes fun and exciting stuff. Okie dokie. Uh, so I think that's mostly what we wanted to talk about today. And our technology was reasonably okay today. We didn't have any did major it. hiccups. I think we're ready to have another guest on next week and potentially break our technology all over again. Maybe we can. I want to give another shout out to the Game Jam too. Again, uh, Game Dev TV Game Jam 2022 coming May 20th through May 30th. If you submit a game, you get a free course, any course of your choosing, which is super awesome. So uh, put it on your calendars. Uh, take 10 days off work. Do whatever you need to do to make it happen because uh, I think it's going to be awesome and it's exciting. And uh, I want to and see all of the community games. And Tim will personally be playing and streaming a lot of the games, giving thoughts on it, feedback on it, um, you know, ideas, etc. So there'll be a lot of community interaction, a lot of opportunities yeah. to, you know, hey, how should I make my game better? Or do you like this feature? Or lots of chances for people to have a look at what you've done and just help celebrate. Hey, you, you did a thing that's really cool. And for us to all be looking at it and talking about it. So yeah, it's sure. a good, good chance to dive in. If you haven't done a game jam before, this is going to be your first one. This is the one. Um, be a finisher. Finish a game. Finisher. Launch a game. Publish a game. And just do it. Just, just make your dreams come true. Just... Uh, and if you guys wouldn't mind, please clicking the like button if you're watching this on YouTube, uh, which I'm sure you are. Um, and, you know, subscribe. We're slowly making our YouTube channel more useful and relevant and interesting and better and and you know, evolving it and all that kind of stuff. So anything we can do to show Google that, you know, our YouTube channel is not awful. Um, Smash that like button, like, share, subscribe. And <laughs> bros will totally be back with another awesome content next week. <laughs> gotta, we gotta work on like outro button. a little bit. Yeah. yeah. We, gotta, we gotta have those thumbnails where we're like, totally be awesome. Awesome. Tim, thanks for hanging out. Always lovely to talk to you. I look forward to our, for me, it's Wednesday. For you, it's Tuesday. To our Tuesday chats. Tuesday chats. Um, always Tuesday enjoy them. And chats. thanks, everyone, for watching and indulging us as we wandered and meandered through a conversation about productivity and a few other bits of nonsense. Productivity and game jams and college and game jams. all kinds of stuff. Don't do drugs. That's the message of today. <laughs> work hard, chase the dream, all that kind of good stuff. So thanks everyone Great for games. joining us today and we will talk to you all again.